Hello, I'm Noah Ross, and this is an illustrated talk on the periodic table. Have you ever wondered, what is this thing, the periodic table? What does it do? What are all the little elements for? What's with all the bizarre groupings? Well, I'm here to answer all of your questions about the periodic table and the periodic table deconstructed. Now, the first thing that you want to know is what exactly is an element. An element is a different type of atom. Let's go over what an atom is. An atom is, a, is an extremely small particle that makes up everything you can drop on your foot. The meaning of that is something that is solid and that you can drop on your foot. This does not include stuff like light and electricity because you can't drop those on your foot, right? But like anything normal, like this table, my hands, all that stuff, that's made up of atoms. And all these elements are just different types of atoms. Now let's go over what's inside an atom. These, all these little circles and dots and stuff are things called subatomic particles. That's just a fancy word for things that are smaller than an atom. This big cluster in the middle is called the nucleus. It is made up of protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged particles, and neutrons have no charge at all. These little ones whizzing around on the outside are called electrons. The electrons have a, an important job. Now you might be wondering, is there really only 118 different kinds of elements? There, I mean, there's got to be more, right? Because there's more than 118 substances on Earth. Well, you're right. These elements can join together to form compounds, which are like mixtures of different elements. Now how do they do that, you might ask? Well, this is, this is where the electrons come in. These electrons, see, there's only four in the outer electron shell. But what an element wants to do is to get eight electrons in the outer shell. But most elements only have, only have a lot less than eight. So they join up with other elements by sharing their electrons so they can get eight electrons in their outer shell. Now this group right here, the blue group, is called the noble gases. And these have all eight electrons filled up. So they barely make any compounds at all. But the rest, they all don't have quite a ton of electrons, so they join up with others to form their, to form all eight electrons and to form compounds. Now, let's go over the arrangement of the periodic table. We start here with element one, hydrogen. We go to two, helium, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. We keep moving down the line until we reach number 56. Then we jump down here to 57, and we go all the way to 71, then we jump back up to 72, and go to 86, where we go to 88, jump back down again to 89, and then go all the way to 103, then come back up to 104, and go all the way to the last one, 118. The reason why this, these two groups are way down here instead of here, where they're supposed to be, is because if these groups were there, then the periodic table would be really, really long. And that wouldn't be too fun for nerds like me who have to carry periodic tables around, right? So that's how the, the order of the elements goes. Now let's go over the groups. What are all these little groups do? What's the difference? Well, the first group right here, not including number one, hydrogen, is called the alkali metals. The alkali metals are very reactive. Reactive is a fancy word meaning that if you drop them in water or some other substance, that they can blow up and cause what's called a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions are like exploding, elements forming compounds with one another, all that good stuff. Well, these, this group is obviously very reactive, like I said. So, it, for example, if you drop a piece of sodium in water, it will give off flammable hydrogen gas, which could blow up. But, but, but you might be wondering, I thought sodium was the stuff in salt. Well, yes and no. So the salt is actually sodium chloride, which is sodium and chlorine combined to form a compound. Pure sodium is very dangerous to eat. You probably couldn't eat it pure, you'd die. This group right here is the alkali earth metals. These are a lot like the alkali metals, but less reactive and a little more tame. For example, magnesium is a lightweight metal that's used for bike parts, but it, it's also quite flammable. This big green group here is called the transition metals. These are some of your everyday metals and some of the more valuable ones, like platinum and gold and silver. 
This group is quite a varied group and contains many different elements. Some of them you are pretty commonplace, like iron and cobalt and nickel, and some you've probably never heard of, like scandium and vanadium. This is a very varied group, so I won't really go over any in depth, but a lot of these are very important. This little blue group right here is called the poor metals. Generally, these metals are a lot softer and easier to melt than the transition metals. For example, indium can be cut with a butter knife and even with a fingernail. That's how soft it is. Tin has been used for toys and other things for a very long time. And the ancient Romans used lead in their pipes. Now we know that lead is toxic, so we don't really use lead for pipes anymore. But that's what the Romans did, because they didn't really know better. Now this group, this sort of pinkish purplish group right here, is called the metalloids. These are sort of a combination between metals and these green non-metals. They have some characteristics of the metals and some characteristics of the non-metals, but they don't really fall into either category, so they have their own category. For an, an example, silicon, it looks like a metal. If you hold a piece of silicon, it'll look like a shiny gray rock like a metal. But in reality, it, it's not much similar to a, a metal. For example, it's a semiconductor. That means it conducts electricity, but not very well. Elements like copper and silver and gold conduct electricity very well, so they're just called conductors. But silicon, it doesn't conduct it too well, but it does conduct electricity, so it's called a semiconductor. These have silicon and germanium, too, are both semiconductors, so they have important applications in electronics. For example, any, any electronic equipment you have, this, this laser pointer, the TV you're watching this on, it probably has some, some semiconductors in it and transistors, which is an electronic component. But since this isn't an electronic presentation, let's move on. This, this green group right here, it also includes number one hydrogen, is called the nonmetals. They're, they're, they're obviously not metals. Why else would they be called nonmetals, right? So these are all pretty important to human life on Earth and pretty much any other life on Earth as well. For example, we're carbon-based life forms, right? So obviously, we're mostly made up of carbon. Nitrogen and oxygen make up almost all of the air we breathe, and phosphorus and sulfur are also important elements in our body. Selenium is, is an interesting element because if you have too much of it in your body, it can be dangerous, but if you have too little, it's also dangerous. So you need to keep a perfect balance. This white-gray group right here is called the halogens. Th this group is quite reactive and contains gases, gases, liquids, and solids. For example, if you blow a stream of fluorine gas at almost anything, it will burst into flames. That includes things not even normally thought of as flammable, like glass. Isn't that crazy? Chlorine is a very toxic gas that was used in World War I until they saw that it, that it killed both sides, the people that they were trying to kill and the people who deployed the chlorine gas. Bromine is, is sometimes used in pools to um, get, get rid of bacteria and stuff. And, and so is chlorine. But it's not pure bromine or pure chlorine. Obviously, that would be toxic. But it's all compounds of each. Iodine is also important because you need to have a certain level of iodine in your body. And in olden times, when there was no iodized salt, people would chew iodized gum to get the iodine they needed. If you don't have enough iodine, you get a lot of nasty diseases. Now this, this group right here is called the noble gases. These have all eight electrons filled up in their outer shell, so they make almost no compounds at all. Neon signs are, in fact, actually made up of neon, because if electricity is ran through a tube of neon, it will glow bright red. So the red neon signs are actual, actually made of neon. The rest so-called neon signs have other elements in, in them. This group right here is called the lanthanides, or rare earth metals. The name rare earth metals is a little bit misleading because none of them are very rare. They're all quite chemically similar, and they're hard to tell apart from one another, and they're all found in the same place. So most of them don't really have much purpose because most of these elements that have a property, they're outdone by some other element here. Like, for example, if one of these conducts electricity pretty good, there's an, there's, there'll be another one in this, in this little group that conducts electricity even better. Of course, copper and gold and silver conduct electricity the best, so obviously these aren't used for wires, but that's not the point. 
This group down here is called the actinides. The actinides are all radioactive, and we'll go over what radioactive means in a bit. Now, these all have different purposes, and mo but most of them are too radioactive to have any practical purpose, and many of them have only been dis discovered in labs, and they're all man-made, except for these four right here, which are naturally found. Uranium and plutonium are used in bombs, obviously, and the actinium, thorium, and protactinium are all pretty rare, so most people haven't heard of these. Now, let's talk about what is radiation? Why is it so dangerous? What's the big deal? Why do we need to like bury our radioactive stuff and like send it out into space? What's the, what's the big deal? Well, let's go over what is radiation. Well, radiation is when one of these elements loses some protons and neutrons. These elements that don't have the little radioactive symbol are so called stable, meaning that they will never lose protons and neutrons. But these radioactive ones, they sometimes lose their protons and neutrons. And since this little number on each element corresponds to the number of protons in the nucleus, like 102, 102 nobelium has 102 protons, zinc has 30, and these little numbers just correspond to the number of protons in the nucleus. But since these lose their protons and neutrons over time, it's called radioactive decay, they become different elements. So like if 102 loses two protons, it becomes 100 fermium. Now why is this such a big deal, you might ask? Well, they're becoming whole new elements. It's like transforming lead into gold, the, the alchemist's dream. But obviously that's not possible. But these radioactive elements, they decay into other elements over time. Each has a different half-life, which is a video game, but that's unrelated. The half-life, let's say you had a big block of uranium, which would obviously be illegal, but that's not the point. Let's just say you did. And let's say you waited out its half-life, which is three million years or so. After that time, about half of that uranium block would have decayed into another element. You waited another, another half-life, now only a quarter of it would still be uranium. The number keeps getting half and half and half until there are virtually no atoms of uranium left. But it doesn't end there. The, the, the one it decays into, thorium, is still radioactive. So if you wait out that one's half-life, half of those thorium atoms will be gone and turned into another. And then it'll keep going and going until it reaches a stable element. And then it'll just stop. Now, why is radiation so dangerous? What's the big deal? Well, since, since, these, uh, since these radioactive elements, they lose their protons and neutrons, well, the protons and neutrons don't just disappear. They have to go somewhere, right? That's not, that's not how physics works. Things just don't disappear. Well, when a radioactive element decays, it can re release certain particles from its nucleus. For example, some release alpha particles, which are two protons and two neutrons. These are the most dangerous kind, but these are, can be easily blocked by a sheet of lead, so they're not that dangerous. The second kind are beta particles, which are electrons that are released from the nucleus and just go whizzing around. These aren't too dangerous, and they can also be easily stopped. The third kind are gamma rays, which are the least dangerous, but the hardest to stop. Gamma rays are little waves of, uh, of radiation that radiate out and uh, hit something, which could cause it to transform into a radioactive element, but these aren't too dangerous either. Now you know about atoms and what they do. You know about the arrangement of the periodic table. You know about the different groupings of the periodic table. You know about radiation, why it happens, and why it's dangerous. And now you know almost everything you need to know about the periodic table. Thank you for watching, and are there any questions?